On our planet, there seems to be an infinite number of beautiful places one can visit with an equal number of spectacular things to admire. It requires nothing more than a curiosity to observe what is all around you. The miracle of nature manifests in countless ways, from breathtaking vistas to the simple movements of a common heifer. The purpose of this program is to present you with the extraordinary diversity of our miraculous blue planet so that you can discover these things for yourself. Today, we head off to the north of the United Kingdom to encounter some dramatic mountain sceneries. The Scottish Highlands, a place where the best whiskey in the world is made and where the men still wear skirts. Actually, they're called kilts. On the shores of Lake Baikal, the largest, deepest, and oldest lake in the world, we'll taste local fish and the vodka they make out of milk. To conclude, we will explore Spanish Andalusia and the mysterious Sierra Nevada mountain range. But first, the Scottish Highlands await us. The landscape of the Scottish Highlands is ruggedly beautiful. The people living here are down to earth, unpretentious, and take pride in their traditions and their origins. Life has been tough here, which, over the years, has given the local population pride and enjoyment. The annual Scottish Games consist of many events that date back to the first games ever held. Among the crowd favorites of today's version of the games are the Highland Dance, playing on Pibrac pipes, and log throwing. The tradition of the Scottish Games was established in the 11th century by the Scottish King Malcolm Canmore. The original intention of the Games was to ensure that each Scottish warrior could demonstrate strength, agility, endurance, and bravery. The most competitive warriors were selected into the King's party. The choice was not always easy to make, as the Highlanders were powerful and as relentless as they are today. To give up, is to accept defeat. The true Scottish warrior would rather die than surrender or lose. Centuries of ruthless fighting with enemies and enduring their inhospitable surroundings have become an integral part of their culture. The highlands are no place for the less than hardy. It is rough here. The sharp, cold wind blows so hard that even cattle and sheep have evolved with long, thick hair to help them survive. But on the rare occasion that the sun does come out, enveloping the rolling hills and picturesque valleys in its rays, the highlands become a breathtaking place to be. More than anything else, the Scottish Highlands have always been a land of herdsmen living in humble abodes. Up until modern times, the only source of fuel for the fire was dry peat. The cattle and sheep were their only means of survival. The most common winter meal in the old days was cattle blood mixed in with oatmeal. But fortunately, they've always had their whiskey. Today, there are several hundred functioning distilleries throughout the Scottish Highlands. Secret, centuries-old recipes that have been put through the test of time are diligently followed. This delicious golden liquid, referred to in the old Gaelic as Uwiske Beatha, the water of life, is derived from pre-germinated barley. They have been making whiskey in the old Pulteney distillery in the town of Wick since 1826. Prince Charles is counted among its many happy customers and orders his cask from here. It is no wonder the distillery needs to operate 24-7. The natural center of the highlands is Inverness, a town lying at the mouth of the River Ness. Long ago, Inverness was an important port, serving mostly as a transshipment yard and the center of shipbuilding. Undoubtedly the most well-known place of the Scottish Highlands, and possibly in the whole of Scotland, is the Loch Ness Lake. Veiled in mystery, 
the lake has achieved its celebrity status thanks to Nessie, a giant creature allegedly living in the lake. The first reference to its existence dates as far back as the sixth century, but Nessie only became a global phenomenon in the last century when hundreds of sightings were reported. The creature was photographed and filmed on a number of occasions, but none of the records were sufficiently convincing to serve as indisputable proof of its existence. One of the many amateur scientists trying to prove that the Loch Ness creature truly exists is Steve Feltham. Steve came to the lake 17 years ago, having given up his fiance, as well as the family business in England. He sold his house and bought an old mobile library from which he set up his observatory. He makes his living selling Nessie souvenirs and hopes one day he will be able to prove Nessie's existence. For me, what I do here making these models it brings in just enough money to keep me living and looking for the mystery, looking for the answers to the mystery. And what I do is not about the money. If I wanted to make a lot of money with these, I would be in Drumnod Rocket, where all the tourists go. I'm on the other side of the lock, on a very quiet place, where not so many tourists come here. I've seen one thing that it's too big to be the fish. Maybe 16 years ago, when the waves are all going across my vision, what with white crests on the top of those waves, and something like a torpedo went through against the waves. So it goes bang, 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 through. Very fast, very big. And I don't know what that was. My, my hope is that when we find the answers to what, is, what these animals are, I'll be involved in solving the mystery. And then I feel that that gives me the credibility in what I do to go off around the world and look for some other lake monsters in other places and become an international monster hunter, which is a good job, I think. There is one other reason why the Loch Ness Lake is so interesting. The Caledonian Canal passes through the lake and connects the North Sea in the east with the Atlantic in the west. When examining the map of the Great Glen Valley, the solution was apparent. Three great lakes and two fjords on either side made crossing possible. It wasn't all that simple, though. At the beginning of the 20th century, the British engineers William Jessup and Thomas Telford had to solve a major obstacle a 20-meter height difference between Fort Williams and Inverness. They resolved the problem masterfully by devising an ingenious system of 29 floodgates over the 96 kilometers. The masterpiece was made operational in 1822 and cost what was considered at the time to be a staggering sum, 840,000 British pounds sterling. The Scottish Highlands are a magical place where time appears to have stopped. The people seem closer to nature here than elsewhere. Looking out over the stunning vistas, a man suddenly realizes just how petty and mundane his everyday worries are. The beauty spread out here is breathtaking and at the same time calming in its immenseness.
Lake Baikal is the deepest and oldest lake in the world. Its water is so clean that it could be tapped into bottles and sold straight from its shore. 336 rivers flow into the Lake Baikal, but only one flows out, the River Ankara. Lake Baikal contains roughly 20% of the world's surface freshwater and is located in the south of the Russian region of Siberia, between the Irkutsk Oblast to the northwest and the Buryat Republic to the southeast, near the city of Irkutsk. Its name is derived from the Turk word Baikil, meaning rich in fish, a fact confirmed by many local fishermen. The region is rather cold, with average annual temperature hovering around zero degrees. Considering this is Siberia, the climactic conditions are pretty mild. Unexpected flora can be found here. The Peshinoy Bay, where the average annual temperature reaches 0.4 degrees, is the warmest place along the Baikal. Flora, however, is not the center of attention here. Fish and fishing is what concerns the locals the most. This is hardly surprising, considering that they have the planet's greatest source of freshwater fish at their feet. Grilled fish is the staple food and won't be scarce at any party or get-together. The local specialty is smoked omul, a fish found only in Lake Baikal. The omul is slated at first, then potted for two days, and finally it is smoked. All around Lake Baikal, life seems to center around what takes place aboard a boat. Well, at least that's what the fishermen claim. When the lovely scent of freshly prepared fish pours from the galley at sunset, it almost seems believable. The life of a fisherman is a romantic life. Baikal is best discovered from the deck of a boat. Once afloat in the middle of the vast lake, we can give in to the complete tranquility and realize just how magnificent the lake and its surroundings are. On a boat, we can stop and explore whatever happens to tickle our fancy. The steep cliffs are almost hypnotic. The deep, eerie woods are veiled in mist. The landscape surrounding the lake changes constantly and dramatically. Every few miles, the rocky cliffs give way to open plains. We can also appreciate the deserted grasslands, with a few horses grazing sporadically here and there. Such immense space may seem almost overwhelming for humans more accustomed to living in densely crowded conditions. Should you grow tired of such seclusion, you can drop in for a visit, a chat, and a bit of warmth to the Kujir village with its many traditional wooden cottages called Turbaz. The best way to warm up is with a shot of vodka, but not just any ordinary vodka. The locals distill their vodka from milk. Apart from the main ingredient, the distillation process is not very different from any other. Make the fire and keep adding wood beneath the cauldron until the sour heats up sufficiently and the distillation process begins. Mm -hmm. 
And Rakushka, as the finished product is known, is ready. The locals aren't fussy, and so this bizarre concoction suffices. The boys are looking on in anticipation of its effect on their dad, but these people are hardy. Life is not easy or comfortable here, but the natives are used to it. Not a single asphalt road is to be found as far as the eye can see. Transportation takes place along dirt roads, and so it is understandable that transport aboard a boat is far more convenient and comfortable. The people are close to the lake. They trust and understand its waters, and in return, the lake rewards them. Fish are so plentiful in the Baikal. The only real shame is that the fish processing plant shut down. It used to provide welcome job opportunities, as well as a market for the caught fish. Even on a bad day, fishermen have enough of a catch to provide for their households and have plenty to sell. Over 50 kinds of fish thrive here, including sturgeon and omul. Along the Lake Baikal, fishing is something everyone practices from infancy. It is time to bid the lovely Lake Baikal farewell. We have surely discovered that the standards we use in our everyday lives do not apply in Siberia. Here, everything is bigger, larger, and more vast. Perhaps the people are friendlier here because they are far away from the hurried, civilized world. Here, people must be completely self-reliant and cannot hold anyone but themselves accountable for their failures or their successes. We savor one last glimpse of great meadows, dark woods, and this great, big, beautiful lake. Let us take our final trip along the shores of the Great Baikal in the one-eyed, one-way railway known as Krugo Baikalka. This railway was built toward the end of the 19th century by Tsar Alexander III. The track is almost 90 kilometers long and it goes through some 40 tunnels built by the best Italian tunnel engineers of the time. Until the end of the Second World War, the Krugobaikalka was the only railway connecting Russia with Siberia and the Far East. In the years 1947 to 1949, a brand new electrified railway, known as the Trans-Siberian Railway, was built to replace the Krugobaikalka. As a result, the Krugobaikalka immediately became obsolete. Today, under the name of the Baikal Express, it only serves to provide sightseeing for tourists. Andalusia lies southernmost on the Iberian Peninsula. The Andalusian landscape is as changeable as the clouds in the sky above and as untamed as its hot-blooded people. The landscape manifests itself in everything from mountains and green expanses to semi-deserts. Andalusia is staked out by several mountain ranges framing it on all sides. The Sierra Morena, 
the Cordillera Batica, and the Sierra Nevada. In between the mountain ranges lies the plentiful valley of the Guadalquivir River. Andalusia is mainly influenced by two regions, the southwestern Sierra de Grazalena, the part of Spain with the most annual rainfall, and the eastern Almeria, which on the contrary is the driest region. Along with its amazingly diverse natural endowments, Andalusia also offers gems such as Sevilla, Granada, Malaga, Cordoba, and Cadiz. We inevitably must come to the conclusion that Andalusia truly is the pearl of Southern Europe. Due to its location, Andalusia boasts a very colorful history. In medieval times, the Phoenicians, Carthaginians, Greeks, Romans, and Visigoths each had their turn ruling the area. The Arabs took over in the 8th century when they invaded from the Gibraltar. The Arabs remained until they were driven out by the Reconquista, a few centuries during which the Catholics reclaimed lost territories. The clash of the Islamic and Catholic worlds left its mark on Andalusia. The two Andalusian towns where the Moorish influence were felt the most are Cordoba and Granada. Granada is the home of the world-famous Alhambra. The Alhambra is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and the inspiration for many songs and stories. Spanish olive oil is just as well known as the Alhambra. Along with Greek olive oil, it is considered the best in the world. Spain is the world's biggest olive oil producer and exporter. Andalusia is the region within Spain where most of the olives are grown. Should you board a plane to Malaga, some 15 minutes before landing, you will be able to see pink areas from the window. Flamingos. You are flying over the Fuente de Piedra Lagoon, which is the favorite mating ground of these majestic birds. This expansive saline lake covers an area of 14,000 hectares. When it is full, it is commonly very shallow. Then, during the hot summer months, it dries out completely, creating a salt plain. If a humid autumn follows, then several thousand flamingos remain until late December. Nesting takes place even in the dry years, but then the flamingos must seek food from further away. The beautiful town of Ronda lies surrounded by the Serrania de Ronda Mountains in the northwest of the Malaga province. It is surrounded by romantic landscapes laced with steep rocky passes, beautiful chalk pools, and swimming holes with surprisingly blue water. This fascinating town was selected by Ernest Hemingway as the site for his novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls. In its opening pages, Hemingway owns up to being inspired by the English poet John Donne. Andalusia is a truly fascinating land. It really is the last cape of Europe. It is enveloped from one side by majestic mountain massifs and from the other by endless masses of water, the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. In the story, the seagull called Andalusia had to withstand all sorts of currents whirlwinds, and turbulences, but she somehow emerged victorious and more beautiful than ever. A fitting metaphor to describe the region known as Andalusia. Our journey to the miraculous nooks of our planet comes to an end, for now. On the next exploration of our compelling and bountiful planet Earth, we will visit the Arabian Peninsula. We will begin in poverty-stricken Yemen, where the men carry their dull daggers tucked in their waistbands. Then, we will drop by the Yemeni island of Socotra to revel in the beauty of untouched nature. We will continue our wandering in style, by going to opulent Oman. Here, we will explore the intricacies of frankincense and discover the charm of camels. And to wrap it all up, 
we'll witness the breathtaking spectacle of nature on the shores of the Indian Ocean. That's all right here on Miracles of Nature. We hope you'll join us.